Good morning, Hope Community Church. Yes, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Um, this morning we are going to, uh, let's start in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're thankful that we can be, Lord, in your house this morning. That we can lift your name up. As the song that we just sang said, we shout out your praise. If we don't, the rocks will. Convict us that we uh, need to do that. And Lord, may you be pleased um, with our service, with our love for you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Scripture reading this morning, um, Psalm 34. This can be found in the Bibles in either on the tables or in the chairs in front of you. Uh, page 463 for like one verse, and then the rest of it is on page 464. Psalm 34. And I was in Psalm 32, so. It's, it says a Psalm of David, so David wrote this Psalm, and it's kind of interesting, there's a little footnote on, kind of giving a little background into what's going on while he wrote this Psalm. It says, when he pretended to be insane before Abimelech, who drove him away, and he left. That's all it says. And um, just keep that in mind, actually, as we read through this, because it's, kind of, it's kind of interesting. Um, he's praising God even in these times where he's being uh, chased. He's being um, sought after. And uh, we start in verse 1. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called, and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his holy people, for those who fear him lack nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, my children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Whoever of you loves life and desires to see many good days, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their cry. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to blot out their name from the earth. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their trouble. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He saves those who are crushed in spirit. The righteous person may have troubles, may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. He protects all his bones. Not one of them will be broken. Evil will slay the wicked. The foes of the righteous will be condemned. The Lord will rescue his servants. No one who takes refuge in him will be condemned. And as we move into communion this morning, um, let's just keep some of that in mind and if you're going through uh, circumstances and and troubles um, the the Lord's will is is that we seek his face and we do not fear and um, let's go to prayer for communion and and when we're done with prayer um, there are two stations in the back um, if you um, when you have, uh, when you feel like you're ready, please partake. Uh, but I will pray. You can continue to pray. 
Um, we'll have some music playing, and then we will partake of communion. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning seeking your face. seeking your understanding of our circumstances, seeking to not be in fear, but with power and grace coming to your throne. Father, we pray this morning that you forgive us for the times where we don't, where we cower in fear, where we jump headlong into something that we haven't thought through. Father, may you show yourselves to us this morning. Holy Spirit, we invite you here. Work on our hearts as we remember the sacrifice of Jesus. His body broken for us, his blood shed for us for the cleansing of our sins. We're eternally grateful, and we remember it this morning as we partake. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, prayer requests. Um, we're going to move into uh, time of prayer requests. Were there any in the basket? I didn't look, to be honest. Thank you. Thanks, Joel. Um, yes. I've got three girls on my Pam, Gary, and my other boy. Jeremy and, and uh, his wife Kristen are safe in radiation treatment right now. And my little sweetheart Grace, who's over by Chicago uh, with her company has a business uh, for safe travel. And I know God watches over us. And mm. I remember her over here. Yeah, amen. So, Rick. 
had prayers for um, Pam and uh, for Kristen, um, both going through uh, cancer battles, and for Grace um, traveling with her company. Um, anybody else? Prayer requests? Yeah, Tom. Uh, for my sister-in-law and my brother, uh, she has a heart condition. I can't tell you what it is, but it's something like a pacemaker, and that's not working right. So she's in the hospital now. And last week, my brother fell at home, and so they were actually in the same hospital room at Covenant. Wow. And but now Bob's home. And I know, Nathan, you had a, maybe now's a good time to do a yeah. <clears throat> little update on Pam and Gary. I'll just stay on my mic, huh? So I talked to Gary uh, yesterday, and uh, he said they went to, um, she had scans about a week and a half ago, and then they went to the doctor on Wednesday. Um, he was pleased with the scans, or she was pleased, Dr. Chogas was she. And with the blood work, but Pam's been having uh, lots of tiredness. Uh, he said she's sleeping about 20 hours out of 24 every day. Um, it's like everything that's coming back from the blood work and from the scans is positive, but she's not seemingly doing that well, and they're not sure why. She's struggling with nausea and fatigue. She's not eating much. When she was in the hospital, she was dehydrated, so they gave her two and a half hours of hydration, I guess, infusion, to get that up. Um, so basically, just continue to be praying for them, for wisdom for them as they journey through. She has uh, sarcoma cancer, um, that she's on a journey with her husband uh, at home. Um, he said they have a new rule, if you go visit, uh, they're asking you to wear a mask now because some of their family members have uh, gotten COVID, so they're just being uh, extra diligent. And also, he said they love to have visitors, the people that come and bring food, etc. cetera, but um, wisely think about how long you stay. Don't, you don't have to just rush in and rush out, but she's, just because of her fatigue and whatever, uh, be sensitive to uh, having, I guess I'd say, shorter rather than longer visits uh, when you go Visit. So, uh, Gary says uh, he has gotten his sugar back under control, which that was an issue too that he had kind of neglected. And his uh, reports are good that his sugar's back where it needs to be. So, he appreciates our prayers as do both uh, Pam and Gary appreciate our prayers for them and the food that we uh, continue to provide for them every other day. Thank you. Okay, if there's nothing else, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we seek you this morning, um, in some cases, for miracles. And um, Father, we hear this update from Gary and Pam, and um, sometimes, Lord, we don't know what to pray. And uh, we just give her over to you. We pray that you would... As you knit her together um, in the womb, you you know her, and you know where she's at. And Father, we just pray that you be God to her today, that you would start to mend her body from the ravages of the cancer, of the treatment, that Lord, um, she might have some, some time of uh, more awakeness, less nausea, less pain. Uh, Father, we just lift these things up to you. We're thankful for um, Gary's ability to uh, get his sugar under control and, and, um, and taking care of her at this time. And we just pray that your strength 
may be in him um, while he's going through all of this. And um, <clears throat> Father, we uh, just give, give Pam and Gary over to you this morning. Father, we, uh, we pray for um, these family members of Tom's that, that were both in the hospital at the same time in the same room. And, and uh, um, Father, sometimes these things happen, and, and Father, we don't know why. Um, we, are, we are given these jars of clay, um, and uh, they're frail. And Father, we just pray that you would be in that situation, that you would give strength as Bob is back home and, and she is still in the hospital, that you um, see them through to being back together again. And uh, Father, we would give you the praise for that. And, um, Father, for these, this one that um, is friends of, of um, the Johnstons where she's had to have her leg amputated, we just, um, we lift her up. We just pray that you go before her and, and this new normal that she's going to have to deal with. And uh, Father, we pray, Holy Spirit, that you move in that. And we're thankful for uh, Tom and his um, network of people that he knows and his love for you um, for being willing to lift his friends up to you. And I know that he is vocal about telling them, hey, my church family is praying for you. We just pray that, that you continue to do that and you continue to move in Tom. Um, it's a blessing to see him standing and, and worshiping in the morning and we just pray that you continue to work there. Um, Father, we have uh, many of these other prayer requests where um, we lift up and I can think of um, Diane Williams. Um, I do have had heard that she's gotten back all of the tests that they've run and um, everything's coming back negative. They've got her on medication to control, um, um, hopefully, the, the, the TIAs that she had. And um, she's got a very bright um, outlook right now. And uh, Father, I pray that you, uh, first I praise you for that, for bringing her through all of this. And, and I just pray that, that you would uh, bless her this morning and uh, um, continue to move in a mighty way in her life. Lord, we um, think about the things that go on around us and um, sometimes we, we shake our head. We hear this word fear and sometimes we get anxiety for what's going on and help us to take the time in the day to step into your world, which isn't really our world. We're just strangers here that we take that to heart, and Lord, that we step back and understand that um, some of these things are just going to happen. We're not going to have any control over them. But ultimately, we know who we are, we know whose we are. And in that, we take solace and comfort and hope in this time of not. And Father, uh, we pray for our uh, partners. We pray for redeemed children in Haiti. Uh, we pray that you continue um, to help people um, in rebuilding uh, after the disasters they, they had continued to have. And um, we just pray that, Lord, your word goes out, that your spirit moves, and that people be drawn to you through that ministry. Uh, we're thankful to have a connection to it. We pray for Hope House Detroit. Um, we pray that as they have uh, ministry in the public schools in Detroit, uh, we pray that you would just expand that and, and really just help people to see that it's not all of the stuff they need, it's you. And may that be fully evident. And we're thankful for Gary and Becky's lives and their, their sacrifice, and we pray that you continue to bless them and for um, the partners for um, pastors. Uh, we just pray that uh, you would continue to move there as well and in their work um, that they are doing to, to just build a foundation 
for pastors in places like Haiti that um, they could have learnings and that they can they can learn how to deal with situations and and how to teach and be molded by you um, father we pray that um, you continue to move in mighty ways we see you're moving we're thankful for that uh, we lift all these things up in the mighty name of Jesus amen um, sharing of gifts and offerings we have a basket in the back we're still doing that. Um, we, you can give online at uh, hopefrankmuth.org or we have a P.O. Box 94, um, Frank Muth, Michigan. So some announcements. Women's groups are meeting um, and I hear they're, they're flourishing. These things are going great. Uh, Tuesdays at 9.30 in the morning, Wednesdays at 6.30 p.m. Uh, men's groups in the morning on Thursdays. And um, if, if you can... Think about it in your prayer time. Pray for these groups. Pray for these groups um, as they're seeking uh, to draw near to God. Be the light. Opportunities. Uh, the next one is Operation Christmas Child boxes. That will be on November 21st, and so my guess is is that we're going to be doing some collecting beforehand for that. Already have. Been. Already have been. Yeah, I can see back at the table. Uh, behind the Bernards, there's a there's a there's a pile of materials back there. So, uh, thank you for your faithfulness there. Also, we're going to be working with the community Thanksgiving dinner and doing some Christmas caroling. So, be mindful of those things and and hope that you can be involved. Uh, the Chosen season two. There are DVDs available um, back at the information booth for twenty five dollars. So the the season two is out. If you haven't watched The Chosen, it's it's quite amazing, and it it gets you to think. Um, they're going through stories, and obviously we read them in the Bible, but they're trying to put them into context of what could have happened. Um, what could the personalities of these Bible characters have looked like? Um, and it's really, it's, it's quite an interesting thing to, to follow. And so I, I would strongly suggest that um, if you have a chance to watch those. And share your story. Do we have a story that somebody would like to share? And in, in here it says any stories that you've seen God working over the past nine years even. So, Jean, you have a... Um, I'm just grateful for God's um, working in our lives when, even when it oftentimes might appear, seem to us, He's not. And um, this past week, um, our friends, um, Jim and Jenny, who have the son Daniel is paralyzed. By the way, um, if you can remember him in your prayers and continue, he's he's just. Um, this past September was four years of being paralyzed and. He's just not doing well with it. He's not coping well with it. Very angry, and it's very hard on them. But out of the out of the blue, usually usually our communication is more through text, or and we haven't seen them in person since last October. But um, they called us this week, and um, we're just catching up. And as they were sharing something with us, um, Jim said, um, "Oh, you know." This has really helped us, and we want to pass it along to you. And um, so he said, I'll send it to you when we get done talking. And so he sent some information to us. And um, the very next, it was either that evening or the very next day, um, someone in our family brought a concern to us. And it was exactly the information that Jim had sent to us that could help our family member. And it just hit me that God's always at work. We, we, and if you're like me, me, I think we have a joke at our house I'm, when I get going in the wrong direction, which can be a lot, <laughs> that um, there's only one savior of the world, Jeannie, and it's not you. <laughs> and um, I remind myself of that quite a bit. Um, because it's true. I, I think being the firstborn, I, I just huge responsibility magnet and um, 
I just feel this weight all the time. And I just, it just was another reminder to me, God's got you, Jeannie, and he's got things covered. He doesn't really need your help really all that much. Uh, you can be involved with him, but... He's um, glad to have your involvement. That's right. He's glad for my involvement to connect to him, but he doesn't need me to get things done. So it was just a big reminder to me, a subtle... It wasn't so subtle, actually. It felt really like a big reminder, even though it was a smaller thing that God did. Thanks, Jeannie. Anybody else? <coughs> Brett? Yeah. I just... Uh, Mary, my wife Mary, had a little procedure this week, and so she's recovering from it. That's why she isn't here today. But she has this ministry of sending cards to everybody that's just so cool. Mm -hmm. uh, no thanks to me, but that's her job. You know? So it would just be nice if everybody here could send her a card to get well soon mm -hmm. we're thinking of you or whatever. So. One, two, three, drink line. Yeah, address one, two, three, drink line. Johnston's Mary. Um, she's had a, a procedure and um, if you feel the need, send her a letter. And uh, we've been the uh, recipients of many of Mary's letters and um, always thoughtful much appreciated so uh, let us try to also um, shed her with equal amounts of, of love a good point Tom so we had so just before you do that all right on that note uh, October is past appreciation month and I'm not soliciting <laughs> <laughs> but what struck me is that we often just focus on the pastor and not the other people that are involved in the ministry and so I just want to encourage you all uh, to do something like what Tom just mentioned for Mary for Christina who is our children's ministry director ministry project assistant she helps me out in multiple ways and I know we all appreciate her but maybe don't mention it or don't write the card. So if you could bring next <laughs> Sunday, uh, it's great that they're not here today so that I could me mention this. So just bring like a card, just some expression of your appreciation for her and for what she does, her heart to, to serve Jesus and uh, surprise her. Uh, either, you know, you could send it, but I think just bring it next, uh, next we'll Sunday would little... be great. Something. Yeah, we'll have a little something to go along with uh, the expressions of gratitude that you bring. So, thank you. Yeah, just so you're aware, you know, we, we were at a, another church's outing at Siebel's Pond, like we typically do every year. And our our old, old church does that still. And it's a church that, that Angie's mom goes to and brother. And we were there, and you could tell they didn't have a Christina. Oh. It was... It was it was very obvious they didn't have a Christina, so um, we are truly blessed to have um, uh, her effort. And very. It, and, and it shows, we come in this morning and we're like, uh, now what do we do? Yeah. <laughs> uh, she's not here, I, I don't know where this goes, I don't know how to fix this, so um, these things happen. You know, one of the things that, um, and Angie brought up this story uh, this last week, and I'm thinking of kindness and goodness, and Pastor's going to be talking about that. Uh, there is a, a church in East Lansing, and they just started, I would say, a, a couple years ago. And their whole ministry is really revolved around Michigan State students. Um, th they're more than that, but, but that's really where they're trying to meet people. Um, in the throes of freedom and whatever else they're doing, they could offer the light and show them Jesus. And the, there's, a, there's a guy who works for this church, it's called the Common Church. And he's been down at our church camp, and I don't know how old he is now, is he like 25 maybe? Yeah. And he has done services at our church camp, he has done uh, teaching to the young adults at our church camp. And this, 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 I mean, I look at him as he's a kid. God has blessed him with the ability to, to speak and draw people to himself and to draw people to God through him. 
he and so it, it's just interesting and he's not the only speaker that's part of this church but um they they have been meeting in like gyms and things like that for the last like three or four years i think maybe three um but with COVID, it's like a blip year so i always add a year i tell angie well I don't, is it three or four it's four years um so they've been meeting and, and kind of just bouncing around and they're having lots of people coming to this church and they keep thinking to themselves well we're, we might have to think about having a location and how is this going to work well not by coincidence kind of like the story Jeannie talked about there was a church in East Lansing that the pastor basically got up and said you know we're we're not we're not going to be able to financially make it anymore there's just no way and it was an it was an older um, the church is made up of, of people that are older and there was some 60 70 people that were going to this church and he's like, I don't know what we're supposed to do. I would ask all of you guys to just pray about this. We really need to seek God's face and how do we, how do we handle this? And somehow he got connected with this common church and they got talking and he kind of brought to the congregation, he said, I've got this crazy idea. There's a bunch of college kids that want to see the world change for Jesus. And yeah, we're older, but we want that too. And we, would it be good to have them come in? And they actually did a video and they interviewed quite a few of these older people that were in this church. And the hearts of these older people were, it's just incredible to see because first of all, your, your first response is, no, this is my church. I've been going here for 71 years. And the one lady said that. She said, this is my church. We've been going here for 71 years. That's too much of a change. She said, I don't know where we would be. I, she said, I do, but I, I can't imagine where we're at now and where we were. She said, we have got, we've basically been, um, you know, shot with this energy boost in our church and they're all meeting now in this big this large church building and um it was basically a win-win and it was just cool to see you know the whole idea of goodness sometimes goodness is how do we handle this situation and and how do we handle it where actually we could help somebody else which is actually what they did they had to kind of humble themselves and say we could help this other church out give them a facility and we could be blessed by it as well and so um you know it's just one of those stories where if you if you lead with kindness and goodness these things can happen and um, it's really what what we should be about um, so that's all i have we're going to take a, a short break and then uh, pastor nathan will come up and tell us about goodness and kindness thanks
Okay, if you can find your seats again. We're in a series that uh, I titled Our Outflow War, and it's from Galatians 5, 13 to 26. This is message number six. As Brett said, outflowing kindness and goodness. So before we get into it, I have three questions for you. Three questions. Do you want to be happy? Of course. Okay. Would you like to be considered a good person? Yes. Yeah, great. I hope everyone said yes to that too. So here's the tough one. What is your current path to achieving one and two? More money. No, I'm just teasing. I'm teasing. <laughs> She's teasing. Uh, uh, an answer came back, more money. And those and other answers like that are what the world, the, uh, if you want to say in the air we breathe, are certain ideas of how does one gain happiness, how does one be considered, how would other people consider us to be good, what do we have to do to cause them to think that about us, and we have certain ideas about how to do that, and sometimes, especially for answer number one, it's more money. Um, what's interesting, though, is um, either by failure or success, as the story goes on of our lives, and we pursue this path that we thought was the path to happiness and good reputation or people thinking we're good people, as we pursue that, either we're going to be failing and then discouraged because it's like, I'm not going to make as much money as I thought I needed to make to be happy or get enough notoriety or acclaim or whatever, and so then we get discouraged, like, so how do you find it? Or, as is the case for some people, not a lot, but they're actually successful on the path that they believe would take them to happiness and a good reputation. Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, others like that. They come to a certain point in life and they realize... <coughs> There's really nothing more that I could gain. I'm still not happy. I don't know if people think that I'm a good person. And so I, I don't know if you've heard about the, the charitable foundation that uh, Gates and Buffett and some others put together. And literally they're putting billions of dollars into um, charitable things to be, I would say, to have the feeling that they're being a good person and to be happy. So what we have is uh, the world's way, and, and the scriptures we could say our flesh or our, our apart from God nature that we have inherited <coughs> from Adam and Eve that comes up with uh, self-generated ways to find the life that we want to have on our terms. And then you have this guy, Jesus, shows up, and in John 7, he basically says, Come to me, 
all of you who are thirsty to be happy, to be considered to be good people, you know, that inner desire that we all have, and I will quench your thirst. Basically, I am, those who believe in me will find, and the scriptures would use the word joy versus happiness, but we will find the satisfaction for our souls not in self-generated effort like the world thinks is the way, but through some uh, picture of a relationship with Jesus Christ. And then he says, amazingly, that when that happens, those who do have that relationship with Jesus Christ and have their thirst quenched can literally be a source of living water for other people can be a conduit of God's satisfaction of soul coming out of us to other people. So then in, in Galatians 5, what the Apostle Paul is doing is I believe he's describing with a little more detail and, and like specific, this is what it looks like. He's describing what that outflow of living water from those who have trusted Jesus and are walking, being led by, keeping in step with, the Holy Spirit that Jesus promised his disciples they would receive after he died, was buried, was raised again, went to the right hand of the Father. And once that happened, then he would send the Holy Spirit, which happened on the day of Pentecost, and that those who walk with him, are led by him, keep in step with him, are literally going to be outflowers of what Paul describes as Holy Spirit fruit. In that same passage, he also presents the alternative, which is even followers of Jesus can still stay rooted in the belief that they can plan and organize and control their lives such that uh, what they want is what they make happen. And he calls these the works of the flesh or our sinful nature. And he basically says the reality of our journey until we get our resurrected bodies and our sin nature is no longer present operating is there's going to be a war going on between what's going to outflow from me and from you is it going to be our own generated ideas of how to make life work on our terms works of the flesh or is it going to be this fruit of the spirit and so in this series we've been basically going down through the list of the nine characteristics of the Holy Spirit's fruit and contrasting them each week with one or two or three of these works of the flesh just to show what this looks like as we journey through our lives and we've come today to kindness and goodness and so we have love joy peace patience the first four and then two together kindness and goodness and then in contrast to those, in the list from the, the uh, works of the flesh, um, in, in verses 19 and 21, we will have, we're going to look at one of those called rivalries, or some translations call it selfish ambitions, and uh, then go down to the bottom, which I've added three more to the 15, so there's nine characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit, and there's 15 works of the flesh, but then in verse 26, he describes some stuff that can happen if you're being fueled by the works of the flesh. And it's almost like he's given three more. So I've added them to the list. Conceited, provoking one another, envying one another added. So today we're going to look at rivalries and conceit as opposed to outflowing kindness and goodness. So first of all, um, rivalries or selfish ambitions. Uh, working definition of this uh, Greek word. And one of the things we're trying to do is, rather than just read through this and just let whatever idea comes to our mind when we read the English word, to actually spend a lot of time, little time in saying, what would the first readers of this epistle to the Galatian churches have understood when he used this word? And where would they see that being kind of outflowing in their stories in a way that they would say, yeah, that's not what I want to be like. That's not what people like us do. No, we do 
kindness and goodness. And they would actually kind of be able to see the tension and not see it as a list of things to make sure not to do by my own effort and a thing of a list of things to try to do by my own effort. That is not what he's talking about here. He's talking about something that actually comes out from us and I believe tied very closely to the level to which we are identifying ourselves as those who are dearly loved children that God has gifted with the Holy Spirit to coach us, provoke us to goodness, uh, convict us about things that we shouldn't do. And so we're, we're, it actually can be experienced, I would say, as a release of something that's flowing out, not something that we get up in the day and say, I'm going to try hard to be a better person today because I want to be happy and I want to people think that I'm good. And then we try hard and we fail and then we feel bad about ourselves. That is not what he's describing here. And so uh, the release that can come from this and the joy, which is another word for happiness, love, joy, peace, settleness of soul, these things are possible in an amazingly exciting way to me that I hope that you grasp too. So working definition. Selfish ambitions, rivalries. Operating as if bettering myself or my cause comes at the expense of or in rivalry with others or their, their cause. So um, selfish ambition is basically a devotion to my own interest or my party's interest, like the side that I'm on on whatever issue. And it's kind of like a way of seeing everything in life as... Uh, me win, you lose, you win, I lose. So everything is kind of like competitive. And if you just think about how our culture in the last year and a half has addressed the issue of COVID, it unfortunately is almost always in the context of rivalries, rivalries about whose idea about what we should do, what the best thing to do is, and it's like, well, if I agree with you, then my side's losing or, you know, it's, so it's like whose ideas are going to win is the, the, the battle. And so it, it pits us in adversarial attitudes and relationships with other people, even other people in our family, people that are followers of Jesus. So... Uh, just an example of this, even within church settings, I was in, serving in a church, large church, multiple staff, and every year we had to come up with a, a budget, a spending plan. And I remember talking to one of the other staff members, and he said, oh yeah, I always submit 10% more than I really need. Why would you do that? Well, I know the practice of the team, the people that put the budget together is they always think people are probably going to uh, overreach a little bit, and their job is to kind of like cut it down a little bit. And my, I've noticed it's about 10%. So instead of telling them what I really believe we need, I'm going to tell them 10% or more than what we really need so that I'll end up getting the piece of the pie that I think I should have. But what he, in fact, was saying is, I want to figure out a way that I can kind of come up with in my smartness, you know, my uh, competitiveness, so that instead of someone else's ministry getting that money, I will get it for my ministry. So my ministry is competing against other ministries for a limited amount of funds, and these are people's offering money. And it just struck me at the time, how is that different in the world? How, how is that any different than any business out there would approach the people running departments and, and trying to like, you know, get their piece of the, of the pie in terms of the budget? They would do it the same way. That's what rivalry is. Always thinking that your competition is other people. And there's, I would almost call it a scarcity mentality. There's only so much good to go around and so we have to figure out ways to get as much of it benefiting us as we can. And when that's happening across the board, then people are literally com competing with one another and they feel like they're competing against one another. So we're not on the same team. It's almost like 
you win, I lose. Um, on sports teams, often it's like if you're really focused on your statistics, the stuff that they keep track of, you know, and they write up in the paper and stuff, you often will be thinking as you're playing, like, well, if I pass it to him and he scores at this situation, then he's going to be the one that gets praised at the end of the game and then at the end of the season. So I have to be careful, like, not to give him too many good opportunities to score because his stats will be better than mine and he'll be thought of as a better player than I am. That's the same idea. Your success means my failure. My success usually comes at your expense. So then this... Uh, another example that I've experienced is uh, in certain uh, church situations... Uh, the board or the ruling group is viewed almost the same way we would view po politicians and government in our country. It's kind of like, if my side wins, then what I want is going to happen. And if your side wins, what you want is going to happen. And they take that into the church setting, too. So it's like, so who do we have to get on the ruling board so that the things that we want versus what someone else wants is what actually happens? And so you can have, even within churches, a you could almost say a sense of factionalism or like comp competitiveness. And then often the decisions would be, you know, if there's five board members, three to two, or if there's seven, four to three and stuff like that, kind of like the Supreme Court is in our country. And, and what tends to happen is I need to go and talk to one of the four so that it gets switched to our side. So our side wins instead of your side. And so it becomes very political in that in that sense just so you know and partially because of this tendency of human nature uh, we don't make decisions by majority here we make decisions by a principle called unanimity that means everybody has to agree if one person doesn't agree we don't do it until everyone agrees and, he, and the, the person that's disagreeing if something comes up has the responsibility of making the case and convincing the others why their position should be the position we all agree with or to look at it a little more closely and study down on it and spend some time and pray about it to say maybe I'm resisting this for reasons that sh I shouldn't and I should agree with that but what me it means is sometimes the decisions are a little slower to be made, but when they're made, there's no one to politic. It's 8-0. <laughs> you know, it's not like, you know, I just need to get one guy to switch his vote and then we get things to be the way I want them to be. Now that, in saying that, I'm saying anything that someone feels strongly about that is important that they think that our church should embrace, we would invite them to come and make the case for it so that we would all agree and our family, our community together then would say, let's do this without this sense of rivalries or the words uh, we looked at in, in past weeks. And, and actually the works of the flesh, almost all of them and uh, over half of them are geared on this idea of an adversarial type attitude and relationship between people within a family of believers and the problems that that can cause. And that's not an outgrowth or an outflow of the Holy Spirit. This second word uh, that, that uh, I just put the definition up there, conceit, which he lists down in verse 26, is one of the, like, what happens when the, the works of the flesh are dominant is you have these, this thing called conceit. And the, the working definition for that Greek word I would give as perceiving and communicating a story about myself that's better than reality will reveal. I want people to think of me more highly and more positively than someone who spent 24-7 with me would come up with. <laughs> so basically you want like the people that see you up front to have a, this kind of a view of you and the people that live with you like your kids, your wife, <laughs> other people like that or the people you work with are going, <laughs> he's down here, he's not up here. And that's this idea of conceit. I'm literally working at presenting an image or a, a facade of myself 
a mask that pictures me as a better person than I actually am. If the person that we're, we are when we're with people isn't the real us, this is what's going to happen. And so those two works of the flesh, I would say very powerfully uh, work against the two. In most cases, I, I've just picked one of these uh, characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit. But these are so closely related, even in the Greek language, that I thought uh, they should go together. There's three words in the Greek language for good. One of them is not listed in this passage. The other two are. So kindness and goodness are both in the, you want to say, the broad kind of word group of, if you were describing something that, that if you want to say, most people would say, wow, that was really good. It'd be one of these two words. And then this other word, uh, kalos, is a Greek word, and it's more like a non-relational good. I have a really good car. That was a really good meal. These chairs are really comfortable. I, they're really good chairs. So it's, it's kind of like it doesn't have any character component to it. It's not about a human being and their goodness. It's just about something that is good. But these other two words uh, have to do with um, our character. And there's something that can be flowing out of truly and genuinely Holy Spirit guided good people. Uh, I'm going to do them in reverse order because I really believe kindness is kind of like qualifying of, of goodness, the two words. And goodness is a very broad word in, in the Greek language. And I would just say uh, this would be a definition of it. Seeking for and offering generously to others what is useful and beneficial to their best interest. If we experience that, it is, it's, it, there's almost no way that you can spin that to be a negative thing if you're the beneficiary of it. Someone else could make up a story about why someone was good and what they were doing and, and create a story that they had their own self-interest in view and so they're being good because they want something from the other person. But if, in fact, that is not reality, the person experiencing it would kind of go, no, that, that's not it. <laughs> I don't think they wanted anything from me. I really think they wanted my best interest. So, um, in Ephesians 5, 8, Paul says, At one time you were, in dark, you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit, he uses that concept that's in this passage, too, the fruit of light is found in all that is good, right, and true. Good, right, and true. So it's just basically like, what does this other person uh, need? And it, the, there's a the component of generosity in, in this word, too. So it's not just... What's the minimal I have to do that, that crosses the line towards it being good? It's almost like I will give above and beyond what someone might establish as a minimal requirement for it to be considered good. So I'm not stingy with my other-centered, um, what is beneficial and useful to the other's best interest. And there's, a, there's the absence of the pursuit of this benefiting me, even in terms of reputational, you know, someone thinking that I'm a good person. It is not the reason that goodness comes flowing out, not because I want others to think of me in a certain way. It's literally because I see the need, the opportunity, and I go, I would say the Holy Spirit prompts and says, you could do something there. You could, you could help out there. So the um, second word, kindness, is uh, offering sincere presence, our genuine self, not the masked person that we want them to think we are, that we really aren't, but a genuine presence, sincere, which involves care and no strings help in ways that puts the other at ease, 
making it easy for them to receive. So this second word really has the idea of it's, it understands that it's hard to be the recipient of someone else's benevolence. It's not easy to receive. When we, even when we need to receive. We feel like obligated or that we're going to have to pay them back or that who am I to deserve this kind of help. The kind person in subtle and creative ways makes it easy to receive the generous help that the goodness of another person is presenting. So it's almost like you don't feel any sense of obligation that there's a subtle kind of expectation to repay or that I have a little kind of a debt lined, you know, I'm like banking some, <laughs> I better be coming through for this person in the future because they came through for me. None of those kind of associated obligations with the combination of kindness and goodness working together. So, I'm thinking this week about this message, kindness and goodness. So I'm thinking, when, when have I experienced goodness and kindness? And I would just invite you right now just to think. Just think about your life and say, based on what I just described as goodness and kindness, when is a time, a piece of your story where you say, I was a recipient of goodness and kindness. That was a very good and kind thing that was done for me in that situation. And the reason I'm suggesting we do this is because the way God made our brains is that we will not do anything that we have not either seen so that we could imitate it or imagined as a possibility for us. So if we literally say in our minds, being good and kind is not possible for me for whatever reasons we come up with. I don't have the resources. I'm just not that kind of a person. We're never going to be good and kind. It starts with, and this is, I believe, how the Holy Spirit works. It starts with a, an imagined picture of a different future than what our normal practice is that we then will be given opportunities, surprisingly sometimes, in the future like our friends, Jeannie described, who called us completely out of the blue. And in the course of the conversation, without this being the reason for the call, he actually shared some things with me that were very good, helpful things that I just kind of banked away. I mean, it's a picture on my phone with like a picture of four pages of this description. I have no idea when this might be something I would need. And literally the next morning, I get this text about a situation. I'm going, that thing that I got last night would apply perfectly to this situation. So then I literally have it already on my phone and I just can like pass it on. And I can't remember the response, but it was something like this is like, this is amazing or this is exactly what I needed was kind of the response that I got. That's what outflowing kindness and goodness is like. I'm not thinking, okay, that guy owes me, and, and Jim's not thinking, you know, that we owe him because he gave us something good. It's just like, there it is. So, do you have at least one in your mind? If you can't come up with one, spend some time this week and thinking, when are the times in my life when I have been the recipient of goodness and kindness? So I just have a couple stories here. So when I was 17 years old, after spending three years away from my parents, and you guys that have been here for a while know the story, that they went back to the mission field, my brother and I stayed here in the States, and finally then when my brother's getting ready to graduate from high school, they come back, and it ended up being permanently. They never went back to the mission field. So they're... Still not sure what they're going to do, but they're living in the missionary house at Jeannie's home church, and Dad is doing lots of traveling. Dad and Mom are doing lots of traveling because they're still thinking they're missionaries, and maybe they'll go to another field or trying to figure out what they're going to do. And so even though we're all together again, we're not literally together because they're traveling a lot of times. So 
On this particular weekend, I came over from Rives Junction to Pontiac, Michigan, and was visiting a girl that was my girlfriend, not for too much longer after this, but... <laughs> Um, and so I came over to visit her, and then uh, their family had a rule that if, you know, one of their daughters was dating someone, that person couldn't spend the night under the same roof. You know, we weren't planning on doing anything inappropriate, but the rule of the home was <laughs> there's not going to be any chance for that, <laughs> whether you're playing on it or not, because you can't even, you know, sleep here. So I had to go and spend the night with her sister's boyfriend, who I didn't know and didn't know how to get to his house. So around 11 o'clock at night, I'm leaving her house, and if you know the Pontiac area, there's lots of lakes and stuff, and so lots of curvy roads. Um, and so I'm following this guy, trying to figure out where to get to his house. My tires are not very good, and it's raining, and it's a blacktop road, and we go around a corner, and he's going a little faster than my car would wisely be driven. <laughs> And I literally lost control. My car on a corner, I taken the corner too fast, goes off the road, I'm bouncing off. This was before the law was that you had to have seat belts. And so I go off the road and I'm like driving over boulders and going through between trees and stuff like that. I hit the windshield in the first impact of something, hit it twice more at least before I came to a stop. I don't remember much. I do remember the guy turned around and figured out I wasn't falling anymore, comes back to get me. And I remember walking into Pontiac General Hospital and having the people that were looking at me, like, you know, cover their kids' eyes and stuff like that. Because, like, this is like, you know, the horror movie kind of look, you know, because, you know, when you get cut in the. I had 100 stitches needed in my forehead as a result of this accident. And one, just a little parenthesis, a side note, I never again have gotten into a car without putting on a seatbelt. Because if I'd had a seatbelt on, I don't even think I would have had any injuries. But they didn't make the law then, and I was just some smart teenager that thought I knew better, you know, than to, even though my car had seatbelts. So anyhow, I'm in the hospital, they take me in there, I've lost a lot of blood, I'm in the emergency room. Um, uh, we need to get a hold of your parents. We can't do anything uh, on you without your parents' consent. Where are your parents? I don't know. Literally, I didn't know. There's no cell phones. They're Minnesota or, you know, I mean, I have no idea where they are. We don't have phone numbers to get a hold of them. So it's like, I'm just laying there and it's like, they're like, we can't treat this kid. I remembered that my Uncle Gil, who I tell people played for the Lions back when they were good, 1952 to 1961. <laughs> so anyhow, Uncle Gil lived literally less than 10 minutes. He lived in Bloomfield Hills, less than 10 minutes from Pontiac General Hospital. And it just kind of came to me as I'm laying there with massive loss of blood and feeling very alone. I have no idea how I'm going to get a hold of my parents so they can give them permission to do whatever they need to do, stitch me up to start with. So it came to me. Well, I have an uncle that's not too far from here, and so I kind of alerted the you know people. So they they give him a call. Gil shows up. <laughs> I think he probably talked the. Uh, police officer out of giving me a ticket because anytime you get an accident like that they can give you a ticket for driving faster than the condition which I actually was <laughs> he's probably asking the you know the police officer is probably asking Gil for his autograph so I get stitches the next morning they wanted to keep me overnight and I said I don't I told my uncle and aunt I don't want to stay here so Gil basically says Gil and Dolores our nephew's not spending the night again. <laughs> He's coming with us. So it's like, okay. For the next week, uh, my Aunt Dolores and my Uncle Gil had me in their home. And it was like I was the, you know, the king of the world or the, the crown prince of the next. <laughs> I could not have been treated with more kindness and goodness 
I, I can't even imagine being treated better. There was no sense of which, like, what's my slacker brother doing letting his kids drive around without telling them where he's at in case, you know, they get in, he doesn't do anything, doesn't make me feel bad about anything to do with, you know, getting in an accident or anything like that. And just, it was an epitome of goodness and kindness. And so I would just suggest to us, there are times when people are in need, in crisis, in situations beyond their ability to extricate themselves in their current situation, that when someone comes through and provides what is in their best interest, what they need, that is a picture of what this characteristic of the fruit of the Spirit is. It's good, it's kind, it's, you know, there's no repayment needed. It's like, I don't deserve this. So, two from my soccer playing days, unfortunately both not real positively reflective of my coach, which I will not tell you what his name was, but on my sophomore year, um, when I was probably the first substitute off the bench, wasn't a starter, but I was playing a lot, we had a tournament at Covenant College, and you could only take 15 players because I guess they didn't want to pay for more lodging and food for more than that. I don't know what the reason was. And normally you would dress 22 players for a game. So we have to like, seven guys aren't gonna to get to go to this tournament. So the coach puts out the list of the 15 guys who are going, and one has to be the backup goalie. So really there's three field players, which is what I was that are gonna get picked. My name was not on the list. Two of the three guys whose name was on the list went to the coach and told the coach to put me in their place. We didn't talk about it, it wasn't like a team meeting. They just, on their own, they said, He's a better player than I am. He should go instead of me. Coach is a little bit of quandary now because he's already like posted his list and everything. So he took 16 instead of 15. And I dressed for one of the games and one of the other guys dressed for one of the other games. Those guys, it, that is the opposite of rivalry because literally what they were saying is, I'm willing to give up what I maybe earned or the coach inadvertently thought I was the deserving beneficiary of this position or whatever, but they were willing to sacrifice that or give it up in their own idea to benefit someone else because they thought it was the right thing to do. Good, right, true. We will more often than we realize, find ourselves in situations where we know that something that wasn't right is going down or happened or whatever. And if we insert ourselves, it might cost us, meaning we might start being thought of as a bad person in the office or whatever because we're the one bringing up that this thing that shouldn't have happened did or that did happen that shouldn't have or whatever. And maybe at cost to ourselves, it's a lot easier just to say, oh, that was too bad. <laughs> but if we move ourselves in and actually are willing to say something, insert ourselves in a way to hopefully influence a movement towards what is good, right, and true, that's what he's talking about here. That is the, the outflow of goodness and kindness. So the next year there was a game we were playing and for some reason, I don't know what happened, but a goal was almost scored. The next time the ball goes out of bounds, um, I get substituted out. The coach starts berating me on the sideline. And it literally, mistakenly, because it was like, that was on the other side of the field. <laughs> I was like, Everyone on the field knew that he was wrong. Everyone on the sideline knew that he was wrong. But it was like, he's the coach. So one of my friends on the team said, literally the coach is like a yard away. 
So with full knowledge that the coach would hear what he said, it's okay, Nate, you did the right thing. It wasn't your fault. So what do you think is going to happen? The coach pivots to him. Literally, in that moment, he kicks him off the team. So he's like walking off, you know, down the side of the field, across the end, like going back to the showers, you know. Because he defended me. <clears throat> so that's a pretty big cost. He didn't decide ahead of time, oh, I think that was wrong, but I can't say anything because then the coach might do what the coach did, <laughs> which happens. Sometimes when we voice the truth, we become the target instead of whatever else. So in his goodness and kindness, he becomes a victim. Well, in both these stories, good came out of it because after the game, Literally, almost the whole team, other than me, the guy that kicked out the team, told the coach, you blew that, coach. That was, whatever you thought happened isn't what happened. And the way you responded was totally inappropriate. And so the next day he reinstates my friend. He never apologized to me, but he did <laughs> reinstate my friend. So... That's a picture of kindness and goodness. Some of you know that a few years ago, I got fired from a church position doing what I'm doing here. Not only was I fired, I was told basically, we want you to have your office cleaned out by the weekend. So on a Monday night to Sunday, and I had a lot of books and nowhere to put them. So we have from Monday night to Saturday night, you could say, to clean out my office. Not literally having any idea who was behind all this, what happened, how it all went down. And so Jeannie and I were at the church in my office, and we had to come up with a plan. And I realized my focus was on the plan. Like, how am I going to find my books if I don't have anywhere to store them? So I created a system so that each box was labeled in alignment with the way the books had been stored in my office so that I could say, oh, that book's in A1 or B6. <laughs> and so, like, I'm all thinking about this plan, not really focusing on this really feels bad. As we were doing that, Gary and Pam and uh, Doug and Barb, who were working to decorate the church, I think it was for, for Easter, for Easter <clears throat> knew that we were, they saw us kind of come in and they knew that we were down there. So in, in a situation like that, it's like it's not real obvious what the good and kind thing to do is because there's lots of, you know, they came down to the office and basically... I would just say grieve with us, wouldn't you describe it that way? Let us know that they were not in any way supportive of what had happened. They didn't really even understand what had happened, but they wanted us to know relationally that if you want to say there's nothing between us. We're, we're with you, we're for you, we love you. We cried together, prayed together. They helped us like move file cabinets and I mean, there was a lot of boxes and file cabinets and stuff, and literally they had to be stored in our garage for months um, while I built shelves in, a, in our crawl space, which is where the books are now. But their movement towards us, the risk of identifying themselves with us in a situation where it's like, I would say literally probably the majority of the people had no idea, was there some legitimate thing? I mean, like... <laughs> Did he do something really bad that, like, we're going to find out about? It's going to be in the papers or something. I mean, they didn't really know what had gone down, what had happened, how this has come to be. But they were willing to move beyond that and actually say, I want to be with you. I want to encourage you. I want to support you. I want to, you know, 
be kind and good to you in this moment. So I share those stories just, I guess, with the idea that all of us will have opportunities where something like that or something a little bit different, but that we have an opportunity to actually outflow what is in the other person's best interest in that moment in a way that makes it easy for them to receive it. And they don't have any sense of owing us anything at the end of the day. We just outflow goodness and kindness to them. That's what I believe Paul is talking about here. Now, I just want to mention to you, I have uh, on the table there, there's some notes for this morning's message, but there's also another sheet that I just called an outflow guide. And it's basically the picture that I have of these kinds of things, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, what it looks like to have almost like the mindset of being always open and looking for opportunities to be outflowing. And so it's kind of like a kind of a general life overview. And I would just suggest if, if you'd like to pursue it further, they're available on the back table. And I just pray that in the days to come, we all would be seeing more clearly when there's an opportunity for us not to try hard to be a better person so other people would be impressed with us. That's a, that's a generated by myself. But to actually be tuned in so that if the Holy Spirit prompts us to do something, to move into a situation that's a little bit complicated or emotionally charged, that we're not going to hesitate because we're fearful or we don't feel like what we have what it takes. We're just going to say, okay, Lord, I'll, I'll do it. I'm, you know, here I am, send me, that kind of a thing. So, Lord, thank you so much for this uh, passage about outflowing, about fruit that, that can be and that you desire to be the experience that those who are around us have of us when they are with us, that we are literally shining in the sense of these are the things that are coming out of us towards and for the benefit of other people. And I believe more than anything else, this is what will draw and attract those who do not know you to you as their Savior and to follow you as they journey through their lives for your glory. In your name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. See you next week. Faithfulness is the characteristic that we'll get to next week.